One, two, three, one, two, three. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, one, two, three. I think we're live. So, uh, today I'll just be practicing. And I'll be doing it with the streaming setting turned on so that if you should have any questions, thoughts, random concerns about uh, anything we've uh, spoken about previously or just anything guitar, you can give me a shout. I'll be here and I'll be working on my own stuff. You can always, you know, interrupt me, ask me something or, you know, ask me if, if I should play something you're interested in. I could just show you or whatever. I'm here for you. Cool, we got Sushira here. New beat official. Does that mean you've changed your username? Are you the old new beat? <laughs> so I'm working a bit on percussive stuff here because um, I've sustained just a, like a slight pain in my um, wrist from extensive legato practicing. So I took a break for two days and then I um, uh, now I've been working on my right hand, so I did some picking stuff yesterday and now started doing some percussive stuff. I'm not really good at it, you know. But I try, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So my goal is kind of to be able to weave that into my lead play. Cool, we got Comdesk here. How you doing Comdesk? I hope you're doing good. able to do is kind of mix uh, different types of time uh, values here. So you're gonna see me try to do maybe something like So uh, that's kind of a really cool effect to be able to throw in and uh, that's the kind of thing that looks kind of difficult but I'd say uh, on the contrary it can kind of help you because it this kind of playing you can throw that in and make it sound cool. It doesn't contain any harmonies, so it gives you a little bit of breathing room. You can just use your muscle memory to play that while your brain can think of something more melodic to play, right? <laughs> or that's the plan at least, we'll see. It's hard. It's hard. I'm working on it. And it's really a challenge to make it, um, you know, to keep the flow. It's very tempting to just, you know, speed up whenever you can and then you're sort of gonna hit a brick wall and just lose the timing. So one of the tricks I think for keeping this up is to really slow down so you have a little bit more time to think about what comes next. <laughs> That's also one of the things I like to do with this, to try to weave in some harmonics. Um, uh, it's always nice and also they can keep ringing on top as you're playing, so maybe you could do it. Or I could, if I were a bit better, I'd let them ring. <laughs> it should be possible at least. Anyhow, they sound cool. Uh, I'm actually also working just the bass lines, so sometimes I really just need to Mm -hmm. 
explain an Ibanez Gem Junior guitar. Hmm, I don't know what the Gem Junior guitar is actually. Gem Junior, is that even a thing? Oh, Gem, Gem, that, that's the Steve Vai guitar where you um, have this grip, right? But I didn't know there was a Junior version. That's cool if there is one. I do have an RG. And I, you know, I love that type of guitar. It's a really special kind of guitar. Um, but, uh, and the RG, the gem is just a version of the RG uh, with, with a few extra features. But I haven't heard of the Junior. Maybe someone else knows more about it. Okay, that's a cool one, my favorite guitar brand. Uh, it would have to be Ibanez, I think. Um, you know, it's always hard to say one specific brand, uh, or it's just like when I get asked what my favorite guitarist is, it's hard to just pick one. But in terms of, uh, when you look at the, the versatility, um, the quality and the price point, uh, Ibanez, I think, is a good, uh, good pick right there. Uh, you know, I have two Ibanez guitars. Uh, I can't say that for any other brand. No. I have an Ibanez RG and an Ibanez FRM. Um, I do have two Fenders, but that's a bass guitar and a, and a Strat. This, this is not a Fender, as you might see. This is just a vintage icon. So this is a really cheap uh, kind of relic guitar. It's really cheap relicking as well, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it works well. I've swept the pickups and I've done some fret leveling and it's a really nice guitar. Uh, so, yeah. But I think it had to be Ibanez, actually. Yeah. Doing pretty good stuff, I'd say. I'd love to get a hold of one of their, um, uh, like their artist, like less Polish style guitars, but also their Strati style guitars. Uh, I think they all look extremely promising. So who knows? Maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> Practice this a little bit. Alan, how to adjust string action is very low. Okay, Alan, so if you're looking for string action that is very low, um, you know, the basic principle of lowering the strings, I think is fairly simple. You can Google for that. Basically, you have uh, like two options. You can either lower these, uh, what are they called? saddles, I think. You can lower them on most guitars, or you can adjust uh, the bow of your guitar, so basically the, the neck relief. And this might sound hard, but it's actually not that bad. Uh, what you're doing is you want to strive to have like a, um, 
if, if, if you press the top fret and the bottom fret here, the string should almost be touching the middle frets here, right? So if you press your thumb here and here, uh, there should be just a little tiny, any bit of space, you know, if you want lowest amount uh, um, of action possible. Some people like a big amount of action, especially if you're doing slide guitar and stuff like that. But if you're looking for low action, that's what you're striving for. However, if you set your guitar up this way by adjusting the neck, uh, the relief, uh, you might discover that you can't properly bend on all places. So you bend and the note dies, right? Now, when that happens, uh, you have another two choices. <laughs> Either you can kind of uh, raise back the string level, uh, so you can re readjust your truss rod and add some more relief, but then you won't have solved the issue, right? Uh, you, that's just a workaround because you'll get really high action and that's not what you wanted. So then you have the option uh, to actually start taking down a bit from the frets, okay? Uh, I have a tool that I really like, uh, which is called uh, the Kitana um, by a company called Rectify Master. So what this allows me to do, I can basically stick in this tool from under the strings and I can do some, uh, I don't know what the word is, filing or, but I can, I can remove some of the fret wire. And because this tool allows me to actually adjust to get the exact same relief as the guitar, I can do so while I have the strings on, which is insanely handy because it means I can do a little bit and then I can try it out and see how it feels. Uh, however, this tool will cost you like, I think $200. So it's the equivalent, I think, of getting it done professionally for one guitar. Of course, the tool, you're gonna keep it forever. <laughs> it seems high quality as well, but uh, Again, so if you just have a guitar and you want it done, it'll cost you just as much to take it to a good luthier and he or she will fix this for you. Um, but that's how you go about it. You can also use lighter strings. Uh, you can use lighter strings, but it's not gonna affect the action at all. Oh, you're saying that if you, okay, if you put on lighter strings, the guitar itself is gonna stretch off a little bit. Yes, true. Uh, when you do st change the st string gauge or if you do some big changes to the tuning, uh, your neck will adjust. So it's the same thing if you, ch if you choose to tune down all your strings, the guitar, the neck is also gonna um, get a bit straighter. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not the, I don't think it's the way to go about it. Uh, you know, those are two different issues. If you want a different set of strings, that's fine. You're gonna have to deal with the neck adjusting, but if you just wanna change the action, you shouldn't have to change string gauge, right? You should instead do what I suggested there. And you can just do a quick Google and you're gonna see like a quick setup. Um, but um, in essence, it's about understanding how to adjust the truss, truss rod. And of course, when you do adjust the truss rod, I should give you a word of warning. Uh, you don't want to apply a lot of force. Uh, if you do, maybe you could break the truss rod. Uh, so usually you just make like a half turn or a quarter of a turn and that's it. And if it's really hard, uh, it could mean uh, that you, you might break the truss rod and then it's better to take it to a luthier. <laughs> just say. Uh, but I was very scared for a long time of doing that and then I discovered that as long as you take it really careful and don't do any you know big turns uh, then it's not a you know anyone can do it I think if you apply a bit of caution <laughs> Okay, adjust the tremolo. Oh, that depends. There are so many different tremolos, right? Um, but the, 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 um, the basic idea is that you have strings inside of the, uh, sorry, you have springs. I think that's the word, yeah, uh, springs inside of the body here. And I think almost all uh, tremolos work like that, except maybe like the Parker guitars have very special tremolo systems. So uh, you're gonna have springs here. So, uh, and those stri springs are attached to screws and you can release those screws a little bit and that means the string is gonna, uh, there's gonna be less uh, pressure on the spring and that means the tremolo will have less pressure and it's gonna uh, tilt upwards a little bit. 
Okay. <laughs> but the, 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 um, now we're speaking about, um, but if we're speaking about like um, a floating tremolo, like, on, on like an Ibanez RG guitar or something like that, um, then you can obviously adjust the tremolo in two directions. Whereas on a Strat, like a six point um, tremolo, which is uh, like the standard vintage tremolo, you can really only, uh, or typically you only set it up so you can do this, right? You can, you can only push the, the tremolo downwards like this and lower the string tension. You can't pull it upwards. So that, that's a fundamental difference in, in, in type of um, tremolo. But either way, the way you adjust the tremolo is by going after the strings, uh, the springs inside of the body. Uh, just to open, open this up with a screwdriver and you have another two screws that are attached to the springs. Uh, the next big question is how to set it up. And that there's a lot of taste involved in that. But if we're speaking about like a, a floating bridge, uh, they usually have some kind of marking on them to make it somewhat obvious to you when uh, the tremolo is parallel to the body of the guitar. And this is critical. Uh, it, these tremolos don't work very well at all unless they are absolutely parallel. Uh, basically what's gonna happen, if that's not the case, then uh, in, in one of, the, uh, whether it be when you press it down or, or when you pull it up, but one of these is gonna change the tuning of the guitar, which is horrible, right? So you have to be right in the middle, that way you can both pull it upwards and downwards without messing up the tuning, okay? So in order to achieve that balance, you're gonna have to look at that marking that exists on, on most uh, floating tremolos, and you're gonna have to adjust the springs in the body. It can take a little bit of time because as you do that, you're gonna have to retune the guitar and go back and forth. So that is why a double locking uh, or, or floating tremolo is usually much more maintenance work. Um, I don't know if this makes sense. As you can see it as like a quick, quick tutorial on how to do it. Uh, by the way, cool to see you here, Davey and Pink. Really uh, glad to have you in here and have you ask some questions. Uh, Mr. Moat, how you doing mate? My bridge kind of floats on my strats. I have a two-point bridge. Yeah, exactly. The two-point bridge, you can set it up floating for sure. I believe you also can set it up just to work in one direction. Uh, I also have a, a strat with that and the, the two-point uh, floating bridge is nice because um, well, it's not nice in the sense I think it sound this this bridge sounds better. But as I said, I also have a guitar with two points loading and it's really nice because you can do, uh, it works a little bit more like a, a, a Ibanez kind of tremolo. And also you can really, you can really do nice tremolo on chords. I can't do it here because I can only down tune the strings. That doesn't sound very nice. But when you can do it in two directions, you can get those chords sounding really beautiful with the tremolo. So that's a major advantage. Good point there. Exactly, it sounds so much better for vibrato. Jeff Beck has his floating tremolo non-parallel, I think, as he insists on being able to bend the G harmonic up a whole tone, maybe. Yep. Um, there are a lot of special uh, versions there. Um, and, uh, you know, you can set a tremolo up so that it works for, like, like you said, there specific notes you want to target or um, also... Uh, um, uh, who, what's the name of the fusion guitarist who has, uh, I don't remember, but yeah, for sure. That's how it works. So you can, you can uh, do a lot of different things, especially if you uh, are a bit more trained at luthiering. There's a lot, lots of different ways you can set up a tremolo. But I think uh, for a six point, uh, the, the, the standard is definitely to not have it floating, but just to have it like 
fixed back, so you can only push it downwards. There's a word for that, which I don't remember. Maybe you guys know. <laughs> Cool, Mr. Moat thinks it sounds awesome. Thank you, mate. So as I was saying earlier, uh, this session for me is mostly to practice my right hand. I'm resting my left hand a little bit uh, because I sustained a little bit of pain while I was uh, practicing extensively, like stretchy legato. So typically I'll do a lot of fast playing and shredding, <laughs> but that's not gonna happen today. It's more of a, more of a that kind of thing where I'm working on. which I also need to work on. I'd love to get really good at that. Um, so that's a cool one. Pink is asking about daily finger exercises. And that's a very broad topic, a little topic. It's a very broad topic. And uh, basically it's, it's it's gonna be kind of defined uh, by what you want to learn, right? Uh, because um, you have to sort of prioritize your time there and the exercises you choose are gonna have a positive effect on your playing if, if you practice them in a correct manner, which we can speak about. Uh, but they can also take you towards a direction you're not really interested in. So you will invest time into something that's not really stimulating for you and it's not gonna be rewarding so that's why when you design your exercises, it should be done having in mind where you want to take your playing. So for example, if you're really a fan of Ingve, for example, um, then you might want to look into, oh, I can't show you that now, <laughs> but you, you might want to look into like um, doing some legato and harmonic minor scales. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the least difficult ways to, to start doing some Yngwie. Maybe do some like pedal point uh, playing like... And that kind of thing is also taking you towards Yngwie land, right? Uh, but then maybe you are into some totally different style of playing. Maybe you're into like John May or whatever. Then, then you could structure your exercises around rhythmic stuff, which is what I'm doing here. So you could just like... I'm not very good at that either, but... <laughs> Whatever. So you would structure an exercise around that. So maybe it, like if you have a more specific uh, a style you're working towards, maybe I can be a bit more specific in my reply as well uh, and give you an example of an exercise. But I can say this. Uh, I, I briefly mentioned that, uh, you know, it's, you're gonna learn stuff provided you practice correctly. And what I meant by that is uh, there's a lot of times we see people who are um, really pushing speed, right? Uh, and it's natural, we all, you know, we're striving to, for a technique that allows for speed and a lot of times um, speed can be a limiting factor. We, we, we don't have the enough shops maybe to play our favorite solo by our favorite guitarist, whatever. So I can certainly understand why a lot of people wanna you know, push the, the envelope and try to play as fast as possible and to achieve that in the least amount of time. But uh, th there is a major problem with that and that is the, the tiny little detail that it has the opposite effect. If you spend you know, a good 80 or 90% of your time trying to push speed, you're gonna learn much, much slower than if you spend 80% of your time playing way below your comfort speed, thinking about being relaxed, thinking about minimizing movement, uh, thinking about being consistent in your movements, and then the rest of the, the you know, the 20% that remains, you can actually try to push your speed beyond your speed limit, okay? So just to recap, don't spend a lot of time on your speed limit. That sucks. You're gonna make really super slow progress. It is much, much better uh, to spend your practicing time way below your comfort speed so that you have time to think about the important thing. Controlling tension, tension and things like, you know, precise finger placement. You really wanna be next to the fret wire, 
that's gonna give you most amount of tone with least amount of pressure. And if you don't apply a lot of pressure, you will be playing much more relaxed. And if you play much more relaxed, you will have much better control. And if you have much better control, you will eventually be able to play much faster. So it all kind of, um, if, you know, it, it, all those different aspects are connected to each other. You have to try to think about everything, which is why if you're a beginner, uh, you might not want to think about this at all and just play your favorite licks or riffs or whatever. But uh, you know, if you, if you have done some progress, maybe you're on the intermediate level and you want to push things forward, then this is super important knowledge for you. You really have to spend a bulk of your practicing time way below your comfort speed. That's the only way to do it really. And then you can devote a little bit of time to actually try to push speed uh, beyond your comfort uh, speed. I hope this makes sense. <laughs> Oh, UK, how do you like to practice arpeggios efficiently for someone interested in moving from pentatonic scalar playing to playing chord tones? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, that's a really cool question. Welcome, Oj, by the way. Um, the, the thing is, uh, there are different ways of, you know, practicing arpeggios, right? You can either look at them as, you know, shredding tools and, you know, do your... Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing, which I don't want to play now because again, I'm resting my left hand. Uh, but I don't think that's what you're asking about. Uh, I think you're asking about arpeggios as tool, uh, as tools to visualize the stronger chord notes. Uh, and that, that's a great thing uh, to, to think about because um, uh, whether we want to be uh, playing outside and being super original or whether we just want to play some really strong melodies, knowing where those strong notes are, are going to be important, right? Whether you want to avoid them or whether you want to play them consciously, you have to know where they are, right? There's an old saying that uh, it's like, in order to break the rules, you have to know them. And th this is a good example of that. Uh, so the way to do this typically is actually, I think that the standard jazz school way of doing it, where you learn like, uh, well, the pentatonic scale is a good start, uh, but more specifically for minor chords, uh, you might want to learn the minor seven arpeggio, which is pretty much the same thing as a pentatonic scale minus one note, okay? We've removed the fourth. So if you have an E minor, the pentatonic scale will be right? Whereas that uh, minor seven arpeggio, uh, we're going to be playing so almost the same thing. So just to tell you that if you know the pentatonic scale, then you already know the strong notes over like a, like a minor chord. Um, and then uh, the, the, you would do the same thing for like a major chord. Uh, you would uh, either, you know, learn the major seven arpeggio, which is a really nice arpeggio, or you would go straight to the, like the, the major triad arpeggio, which just has three notes. And then you would probably do the same for the dominant chord and maybe also the, like the diminished chord, but yeah, if you're into rock, maybe not as urgent. Okay, so that's, and then you learn those uh, scale shapes all over the fretboard. You can use the free tool we have at GMC. If you look at the tools menu, there's a scale generator where you can get all the arpeggios, just choose from a drop down menu. But there are thousands of resources. You can just Google, you're gonna find your stuff. Um, now, something to consider when you're playing these, uh, if the goal is not just to shred an arpeggio up and down, which can be nice, but, uh, maybe not what you're asking about here, uh, then what you want to do is practice over some example tunes where you know the changes. And you're going to try to find the closest arpeggio notes whenever there is a chord change. So this way you don't have to, you know, restart your playing. You're playing a melody in E minor. And then all of a sudden comes A minor. You don't want to be forced to do because you can't really play a melody that way. Instead, you want to do you want to be able to find that arpeggio wherever you are. And that's going to be the challenging part. Um, I'm pretty much at the stage where I can find the, the, the nearby notes, but I'm not uh, so confident so that I can actually also be creative. I have to devote all my brain power to actually finding that note. <laughs> so I guess I have some work to do there. Um, 
Cool, we got Macaulay70. Hi, can you talk about the right hand technique pick, the basics, and how can I play better with this hand? Cool question. Um, so, um, um, this is a cool question, right? The right hand technique. Um, there are a lot of different things you can do with the right hand technique, right? You can do like, uh, like I'm doing here, more of like a John Mayer piano approach, like. Whatever. Uh, you, can, you can shred, right? You can do so the totally opposite thing, right? Or something like that. Uh, or, and you can do anything in between. You can do your. Like SRV, -ish. there's a ton of different things you can do with the right hand. So, uh, and that's not to say you have to do all of them. On the contrary, it's much better if you prioritize the stuff you love listening to. That's super important. Otherwise, you're just going to be overwhelmed. We had a, I actually designed a little meme just for that, and I put it on the GMC Facebook page there. Uh, if you try to learn everything, uh, you're going to stop playing, right? So just choose wisely. Uh, even if you have all the time in the world, mo for most people, uh, you can't just sit around and try to learn everything. You're going to get discouraged. It's better to focus. So the first question back to you, I know that's not maybe what you expected, but uh, is really what style of right hand and picking stuff are you into? So again, maybe you're just into playing some, you know, some grunge or whatever. That's going to be a totally different technique. Uh, now, I think a lot of people asking me questions about this are actually referring to more like advanced speed picking stuff. Uh, and in here, there are uh, definitely some specifics to think about. For example, um, you want to be very uh, machine-like in your movement. You need to be super, not only precise, but you need to be consistent. Um, and that's only really a problem and something you need to consider when you're starting out because there's no way you can get really good at picking if your hand is not consistent or if your movement is not consistent. So that's pr probably number one. As you're starting out on the slower tempos, you kind of need to, in your head, fast forward and see how will this technique look when I am eventually able to play it fast. So uh, that means you really have to have a small, consistent movement. Even if you're just playing... You could play that with a really big movement, and that would be fine, as long as you're playing slowly. But that movement will never convert to the, you know, the, the fast beats, right? So you have to kind of look carefully. Okay, how does Ingve hold his hand? Okay, <laughs> if Ingve is one of your idols. Okay, he holds us like this. Maybe I'm going to do that as well. And obviously when you're starting out, it's going to have to be much, much slower. So, okay, that could work. It's a super small movement. Um, but then this kind of picking has so many complexities to it. Uh, for example, as soon as you start involving string travers, things get more complicated. Um, there's a, there, are, there are easier ways to deal with string travers. For example, you can, I'm not sure it's easier, but you can apply economy picking. You can also do uh, my preferred method, which is mixing picking with legato. Uh, and also Ingve does that a lot, speaking of his technique. Uh, so it might sound like you're picking everything, but uh, if you have a smooth legato technique and a high gain sound, it gets harder to ha hear exactly what is being picked and what is not. So it's a huge topic, but if you want to get more specific, I'm, I'm happy to also answer more specifically. <laughs> I, I hope it somewhat helps. Um, a minor pentatonic jam. <laughs> playing pentatonic chords actually. I don't really know or care about what these chords are. Most part they're suspended chords, but 
it's just taking chords from the A minor pentatonic scale. We had a request there for an A minor pentatonic jam. So you can do that. Uh, It sounds kind of fusion-esque. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and the reason I'm not grabbing a backing track for you now is because I've sustained a slight left hand injury, so all my own practicing is just focused around the right hand stuff. But I've got a lot of requests recently about uh, doing one of these jam or sessions where I just, you know, you guys can suggest backing tracks and I'll just shred over them. So as soon as my left hand is back to standards, I promise I will do that. <laughs> I'm really happy, by the way, you guys are requesting it, because sometimes I wonder who the hell is interested in hearing me play fast over backing tracks, but it's cool, there is some interest. How to play big chords if you have small fingers? I don't know if mine is small, I can only stretch from first to sixth fret. Well, that sounds just about right. Um, I'm no, you know, mastered chords in any, any means. Uh, but the general rule, or probably the general pitfall here, uh, you know, the mistake a lot of people do, is to tense up, right? Uh, you know, the, the most classic example is when, you know, some, when you attempt your first bar A chord, you know, it sounds something, it's gonna sound really, it sounds bad and you just can't figure it out and just press harder and harder and you, you know your fingers get bent and we can see you sweating and all that. <laughs> That's the prime example of where uh, the wrong solution is being applied, right? Applying more force will not help you. So if we take that specific case, it's much more effective rather than applying more and more force. Take a break, five seconds, 10 seconds, let your hand rest and then try again, right? And if it doesn't work, take another rest Try, try again. Still doesn't work, start adjusting your thumb because that's going to affect the angle of that barre chord. Uh, start uh, adjusting the angle of uh, the actual index finger doing the barre chord. Uh, it's also going to affect. Try all the combinations, take breaks. And here's an important one that's going to apply even if you're more advanced looking to do st stretchy stuff. Um, you also want to make sure you apply the least amount of pressure possible. That is gonna be a challenge for beginners attempting barre chords because you do need a little bit of pressure here, but it's not that much. Uh, but if you're working on stretchy chords, uh, what you can do, which is like a classic school in here, is to try each note of the chord, play it separately, but using the finger uh, which you will be using in the voicing. And and see if you, what is the least amount of pressure you can apply. Okay, if I press too softly, there's no note happening. So I'll back it off a little bit. Okay, that's, that's the least amount of pressure. And it works, I still get a note. Now do that for all the, the fingers of the voicing. And you're gonna get a very relaxed kind of posture to play that chord. And I think this is kind of key because the more you re relaxed you are, the more you will be able to stretch and the less the finger length is going to be important. I, I guess it is important to a certain extent, but uh, you know, there's so many voice things. I, I really don't see that it would limit you, you know, even if you have short fingers, but you said you could stretch from first fret to sixth fret, which sounds perfect to me. So no worries at all there. <clears throat> I hope that's helpful. Uh, that's for Hira PRXC. Welcome to the stream, by the way. Okay, so here's another question. Thanks. Can you talk a little about how to mute strings? That's a good one. So again, lots of different applications here. Uh, you can intentionally mute the strings you are targeting to produce this kind of rhythmic dance of right that's the but that's probably or maybe maybe that's what you're asking about that's 
is often called dampening, right? So instead of fretting the, the, the strings there, we're just gonna lightly touch them and thereby creating uh, the, these, um, this damped or dead notes, basically. And that has a big advantage in terms uh, of these notes being totally rhythmic, right? They don't contain any har harmonic information. So uh, you're not gonna be playing the wrong note, right? <laughs> you're just gonna be playing percussive stuff, just like a drummer would do. Uh, and that kind of muting can also be done with the right hand, right? We can do it uh, with palm muting when, when riffing. Um, and we can also apply both of these types of mutings to control unwanted strings from ringing. And this is an area I think uh, which some people might have problems with because it's not as obvious. You know, when you play a riff, if you don't mute, it sounds totally different, right? So you're quickly gonna realize you're gonna have to come up with something to you know get that sound. type of muting uh, where you sort of muting the strings that are not being played is probably more important especially if you're doing uh, like leads and stuff like that but it's not as obvious so for example if we're fretting the G string here uh, on the fifth fret uh, we're gonna attempt to lightly touch the B and the E string with our index finger so that if we were to play three strings here oops That's the sound we're going for, right? Those notes are not gonna ring on their own because even when I pick them, they barely make much sound. Or So that, that's good muting right there. But then we have the thicker strings that are above. We can't really mute them with this finger, just the D string, we could try to touch it a little bit. But the other ones, we're gonna either have to do this, which isn't very common, it's much more common to use the palm mute technique for the lower strings. Uh, so if I hold my palm here, I have now effectively muted all strings but the one I'm targeting. So let's try it. <laughs> it's gonna sound bad. That note is ringing. The other ones are not. And that's the goal. Uh, now in order to you know, it's one thing understanding the theory here, but to actually implement this in your playing can be hard. And the reason being, uh, we have a lot to think about when we're playing. And this is often low priority for people. You know, you just want to play your... You don't want to sit around and think about other strings or whatever. So if you haven't worked on this, it's a good idea to maybe for the next lick you learn or some exercise, you can take it a bit extra slow and devote some extra time and energy to thinking about how to mute. What I like to do is kind of mute a little bit too much with my palm and then back off a little bit and try to feel where that golden spot is. Uh, but it's definitely a, an art of its own, I would say, just the muting part. Uh, and it's uh, very important when you're playing with high levels of distortion or compression. Thanks for the tips. I was having trouble playing Manhattan by Eric Johnson. The chords are beautiful, but so stretchy. Okay, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, really nice ones. Uh, I don't know that tune, but I would say being relaxed and of course, you know, focusing on the actual chord change. So if we were to take an easier example, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, practice, if you have a difficult chord switch here, chord change, uh, then you might just wanna focus on that a whole bunch of times so that, you know, when you're playing, that you're ready for it when it comes in the song. So you just focus on the chord change. Um, that and the, if you do that in combination with kind of active practicing of, of being totally relaxed, uh, then I think that's a good recipe. 
Um, it's often like that. We need to break down whatever we're trying to achieve into like several different exercises so that you can really hone in on each component. And then when you put it together, that's when the magic happens. about vibrato please oh that's a good one uh, vibrato is uh, well also one of those things you tend to take for granted a little bit um, it's like oh can I do some fast bending okay I can do vibrato good move on let's practice technique whatever so that's a very common thing and I, I'd say I suffer a little bit of that myself uh, it requires a lot of practicing as well. And the reason being, um, you know, there's a misconception there that, you know, either you have a good vibrato or you don't, which I don't know, might be true in some cases, but the problem is that having a good vibrato is not equal to having only one type of vibrato. A lot of times the players that have really nice vibrato, they have a lot of different types of vibratos, like Ingwe Malmsteen or Marty Friedman or whatever. So um, that's, I think, the, the first thing you gotta realize is that just as with picking, there isn't just one good picking technique. There are a lot of different things you can do. And with, with vibrato, I think it's especially important because um, it can be tempting, and sometimes I see that, uh, people who have mastered one type of vibrato really well, but then that doesn't work in what, whatever new situation they're confronted with. And then they have no choice but to play the same type of vibrato and there's going to be a musical mismatch. You know, sometimes when you're playing like classic blues stuff. You can do that kind of narrower Clapton bordering Kirk Hammett kind of vibrato. Uh, but uh, for other types of playing where you really especially with distortion, or maybe it's like in a met, heavy metal setting, you might, you might want to get really wide, right? And there's nothing worse than hearing that kind of Kirk Hammett style vibrato in a metal setting. It just sounds like something stings you. Um, so I think that's lesson number one. You have to realize you don't simply practice a good vibrato. You practice several different types of vibratos and you need to find the one that matches the tune. That's the number one. Now there are more, more um, you know, exercise ways of, uh, exercise style ways of approaching this, this problem. For example, you can just practice uh, like rhythmical bending, right? You can have a metronome and you can do just bend like that, right? In time. That's okay. That's an exercise. And then, you know, you can try maybe some other time value. You can do... You know, that's a way to start practicing it. Uh, now, you also got to realize that the actual technique that is used when performing vibrato is going to be vastly different depending on where on the guitar you're doing the vibrato, on which string, and with which finger. So again, we're back to uh, what we spoke about earlier, that we really have to break a technique down into all the different components and practice them separately. And it's not until you've done that you, that you can practice putting them together. So in this case, 
I would try to practice those different ways of doing vibrato on different strings and with different fingers. So as you can understand, all of a sudden, practicing vibrato becomes a little bit more time consuming. That doesn't mean you have to sit with it for an hour a day. I would say, you know, a few minutes of targeted practicing is, is more than enough, but it's important to be aware of those uh, complications for lack of a better word. So, um, and vibrato is super important. Uh, obviously, again, there are lots of different types when you're, if you're applying vibrato on a chord, for example, you're gonna do the horizontal vibrato, or the classical vibrato. And uh, some people use a combination of that horizontal vibrato and standard vibrato, like Steve Vai, which produces a different type of wide vibrato. Uh, and I could go on, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Uh, you could do the whammy vibrato and, you know, the, the list is long. Um, and it's good because that's the reason why um, there are so many unique guitarists that have so many unique tones and styles uh, because there are obviously a lot of unique combinations of these different techniques I'm speaking about. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Cool question, by the way. Uh, how many fingers to use with vibrato? One, three, or two? So the, the point is here, um, the, the more the better, I would say. In general, uh, when, whatever you're doing on the guitar, you should try to be as relaxed as possible. Now, if what you're doing requires a certain amount of strength, like, I don't know, wide stretches or even vibrato, uh, then you wanna use your biggest muscles, right? Because if you use your biggest muscles, you're gonna be applying the least amount of tension. If you try to bend just using you know, your finger muscle, you're gonna tense up quickly and results are gonna be bad for many reasons, right? So when you bend, uh, you wanna try to get the bulk of the strength and movement from your arm, actually. There's gonna be a little bit of finger movement, sure, but uh, we way too often I see people just relying on finger movement. That sounds bad, it causes tension, it causes you to get tired in your hands, it's not a good thing. So likewise, if you have the option of supporting your vibrato with more than one finger, that is also a very good idea. So that's a long uh, reply there just to answer yes, it's a good thing to, ask, to add your fingers if you have the option. Sometimes you're gonna land in a playing situation where you can't, right? You just have to come up with vibrato with one finger. So it's a good idea to practice that situation only or as well. That's a tricky one, for example. Uh, when, you just, uh, when you just have your index finger to use, if you're in the middle here, like on the G string, you can always use like a leverage point here and do your vibrato up and down. However, if you are on the top string, uh, you're gonna have to do your vibrato upwards and you have no other fingers to support. So this is an example of a trickier type of vibrato that definitely needs, uh, requires you to practice it separately. Uh, if you would do that with a pinky, it would also be difficult, but then at least you have these fingers to support. So lots of different combinations there. interesting uh, so um, when you're doing this kind of slapping thing uh, it's really super helpful if you have a single coil setup so if you don't have that but you have two humbuckers then maybe you have like a split coil position so you can try different uh, positions with a pickup switcher and see if it sounds better what I did I activated one of these switches which gives me these two in a series basically sounding a little bit like a humbucker and I could no longer get the twang. So I was like, hey, what's going on here? What's wrong? So with a single chord sound, now I'm using these two as single chords. 
in parallel, then it works well. But if I play these two in series, uh, it doesn't work well. It sounds much more mushy, so yeah. That's how you get that snappy uh, sound. You really want to use signal coil sounding um, stuff. A signal coil sound. Cool, that's a good question. Thanks for your answers. Can you talk about warm up or muscle hands exercise for, to prevent injury? I can, and since this is a, actually a recent issue of mine where I have a slight injury here, uh, even though I think it's almost gone now, uh, it's, it's a relevant topic. So uh, there are a bunch of factors that I found uh, makes, it, makes me more susceptible to injury. Uh, one of them being my posture. This is super important. The more I sit like this, uh, the more I'm likely to injure myself. And the faster I run out of steam, right? So always have a good posture. And that's hard for us, you know, the computer generation. We sit in front of a computer all day. Uh, you know, it, you really have to work on posture. And I, you know, I, I get on the floor and I do, do these um, uh, back exercises. You know, that's what works best for me. That's one, of the, uh, one thing to think about. Posture, super important. Another one is, uh, for me, my shredding really works better if I also do regular physical upper body exercising, okay? You know, in general, it's super important to do exercises. That's no news, right? For your mental health, just go outside and walk and do your jogging, whatever, super important. But specifically for guitar playing, you need to think about your upper body, that's important. So the back is important <laughs> and so are, you know, I find arm and shoulder muscles. And they're all connected, so you can't just do one of them. You need to do all of it. Um, so that's like, like your physique. It's, it's super important, especially if you get older and you want to practice a lot. I mean, you're totally screwed if you don't think about this. Maybe you can get away with it if you're younger, but yeah. If you're like me, above 40, you're screwed anyway. So <laughs> you really have to think about that. Um, now, as far as the actual warming up and playing goes, it's also important. Uh, it's, it's important to say that no matter how good your physique is, if you do really challenging stuff for an extensive amount of time, you're gonna injure yourself anyway, right? There are limit, limits to, as to how long we can keep pushing our body, just as with an athlete, right? So I injured myself by actually playing kind of slowly, but doing really wide stretches and just focusing on the hammer-ons. Uh, probably I wasn't sitting completely straight. I probably had some posture issues, although that's not really something you think about when you're focusing on your playing, but yeah. Um, so having said that, um, you also need to make sure you are warmed up. I mean, this is so critical for whatever you want to do. Um, it might not be quite as important when you're starting out, but even then I'd say, yeah, warm up. And warming up does not only mean that you um, start with something that's a bit easier to play. Uh, it also means that you consciously think about being relaxed. Because even um, challenging material gets easier to play when you're being relaxed. So that's like a key thing to think about, not only to prevent injury, but to play well. So think about being relaxed. Don't start with the most difficult stuff you know about. Uh, try to, you know, actively think about, you know, how does it feel? Am I warmed up? Am I ready to play that thing? Or should I spend a bit more time playing something else? There's always uh, important things you can practice that are not super challenging technically. So there's no real excuse for overlooking this part. So let me just uh, grab some water here, just a second.
Sorry about that. I had to grab a, grab a quick bite as well. Oh, there's a, another cool question by Macaulay70. So do you think it's important, necessary to practice standing or sitting? That's a good one. Um, actually, practicing standing can help you with the posture issue. So if you feel like you're having issues with bad posture, you can at least alternate between sitting down and practicing and standing up. Another aspect to consider uh, is um, the fact that um, if you only play sitting down, you might actually get some issues, you know, performing in front of an audience standing up. So practice playing standing up is something that has to be practiced as well. So, uh, you know, uh, it might be a good idea to, you know, stand up for like, I don't know, maybe if, if you want to, if, if it feels okay, you can do it half of your session, but at least a good five or 10% of your session, try standing up using a strap. I'd say that's a good idea for sure. do I use? Right now I'm using an interesting combination actually. I'm using these two together, which is unusual, uh, but I find it works well for the slapping. So in order to achieve this, I have a push-pull switch here. So when I pull this one up, this uh, pickup is always connected regardless of where the pickup switch is, which means that I can use these two together like I have now, or I can actually use all three, which is, uh, you know, the, the number two position plus that switch. 
I should be able to. <laughs> But um, I'm actually learning this right now as far as, you know, the slapping and that stuff goes. I haven't done that for, you know, much. So, um, but typically I, uh, I, I do enjoy going between, uh, you know, there's this misconception that who cares about the metal pickups, but that's the heavy metal, you know, Ingve school. If you're into more clean sounds, then these three pickups are really useful and mostly because uh, you get that in-between sound. So, you know, the, typically this pickup is great for, for rhythm and stuff like that, and sometimes high gain. Uh, but whenever you want to go a bit bluesier, a bit twangier, you can go with an in-between sound there. <clears throat> and some people I know like to use this just for funkier stuff. I can't say I've discovered... <laughs> middle ground can't say I use it alone that much but then again this in between position I do use it whenever you want to go for a warmer tone a warmer lead tone you want a bit more twang then I'll go for the the in between position and then finally just the the neck pickup is always warm and nice and you know that's always a good choice um, I'll find that the in between positions they don't seem to cut through a mix as well. So if you're recording something like a rhythm guitar, I, I typically avoid the in-between positions. Um, same goes if you want to record like a lead and use that warm tone uh, from, from, from the neck pickup. That's a really good idea. And you might be tempted to get like a warm twangy tone, but a lot of times I find this one doesn't cut through the mix as well. So if you have a busy mix, that can be a problem. But if you have a totally open mix, uh, what I mean by that is no distorted rhythm guitars or anything like that, um, then you can experiment and, and, and use these in between positions because uh, you will get a nice twang. But uh, as I said, I, I don't find those sounds to cut, cut through, cut through quite as much. But it isn't really an issue either. If again, if the mix is open. <laughs> That's a good question uh, about using the volume pot and how do you think about that? Uh, for this kind of clean sound, I, I really dial in a clean um, compression kind of sound. So I don't play with volume here. Uh, but whenever you have distortion or breakup, uh, the volume knobs can be very interesting. Um, for one, if you have a cool amp set up, and a lot of the digital amps have support for this now, you can really dial in a sound that uh, when the volume knob is turned off, you get full distortion. And as you turn it down, you can almost go to a clean sound. Uh, and if you're lucky, you don't have like a huge volume differences either. So, you know, you can really control, you don't even need a pedal board, you just need that volume knob. Uh, so it's good for that purpose. Uh, and uh, also the tone knob can be very, very useful for dialing in smooth lead tones. And sometimes it's just a matter of turning, turning it down a little tiny weeny bit. And it basically gives you a totally different output from the pickup. 
Uh, so you can really control the high ends and if, especially if you're having issues with like really bright and sharp um, sound and you just want to tone it back a little bit and then do the rest of the work on the amp. I think it's, it can be really cool. And there's, sometimes there's no substitute for it, for it. You really have to get the tone down on the guitar before you start tweaking it on the amp. So I'd say both the volume knob and the tone knobs are useful depending on the situation. Uh, tone knob, I personally use it most of the time for dialing in like a creamy high, high gain sound. Whereas the volume knob, I'll typically, I don't use it that often, but I, when I do, it's mostly because I want to control a super dynamic sound and control the amount of uh, distortion. Um, however, I have to say that if I have the choice, I'd much rather dial in, dial in a tone that uh, is totally clean when I pick softly and then gets distorted when I hit harder. That would be my preferred way of doing it. But the problem is if you want to kind of shred with some legato or play some fast legato, then it's not really handy if you need to, you know, hit the guitar like a madman to get the distortion. And in those cases, uh, it can be really uh, useful to control the amount of distortion through the volume knob. Uh, and it's also cool because you might argue that, well, you could just plug a, like a, you could just connect a distortion pedal, right, in the chain, and you could just press the, that distortion pedal and you'd be good. But the thing is, with the volume knob, you have the whole spectrum. So again, if you have a dynamic sound that really responds to the, the volume knob, then it's like you get access to 10 different sounds just by turning your volume knob. And the same can't be said when you enable or disable a distortion pedal, right? It's just gonna allow you to alternate between one sound on the fly. Whereas here, you really have 10 different sounds, you know, at the touch of your your finger there. So it's a, it's a different thing. Uh, but yeah, cool questions, by the way. The, the, these are some subtle things that can make a big difference. you like it Macaulay and thanks so much for the cool questions really good questions there I think we're having an interesting discussion here thanks to you
another question about string gauge. Uh, do you think that nines or ten strings on Strat change a lot the sound or only the playability? They definitely change both. Um, however, I mostly uh, tweak, you know, the string gauge for the playability, I have to be honest. Um, so, um, in some cases I use like a mixed set, so I'll use like 09 to 46 uh, on this guitar. I'm not sure, it might actually be that kind of set on this one, I don't remember. So I have that on many guitars. Um, but um, uh, there's no really easy answer there, because I like the sound. Sometimes the thin strings can produce a cool sound, but if you're going for that Texas blues kind of thing with the Strat, then yeah, you know, SRV was famous for his thick strings and also for his ability to actually be able to play it. But you can see he needs to work hard just to bend that, uh, those strings a little bit. But his tone was fantastic, and uh, the strings uh, gauge, the string gauge has a lot to do with it. Um, in uh, in metal, uh, I hear a lot of you know lead guitarists arguing that you cut through better with thin strings, and that might be true. Um, I like having uh, I like the sound of thick strings on my Les Paul, for example. Uh, I have a Les Paul uh, Junior, and it's. Uh, uh, I've tried having really thick strings and I like the sound a lot, but the sacrifice was too big in terms of playability. So a lot of times I'll just go for 09 to 46, that mixed set. Um, sometimes just straight 09, uh, but that's what I use. Uh, and the reason I use mixed set is obviously because uh, I want to be able to do a bit of a you know thicker riffing, like uh, with distortion and uh, then, uh, yeah, the, the thicker the string gauge, the, the more muscle and the more body you get to it. So uh, it's, a, it's a crazy balance between all of those. But uh, I guess that's why those mixed sets have their place. Because uh, there are a lot of guitarists who don't want to sacrifice the, the chugginess for the, the, you know, the playability in terms of high notes. So, yeah, I'd say mixed set is probably what we go for. Now we have... Oh, nine, oh, nine, five to 46, perhaps. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But you know what? I'd be more interested in trying 08s, actually. You know, the Ingve gauge. Uh, I think 08s could be very interesting. Uh, and we actually had an interesting discussion about that on the GMC forum. Uh, and it, it struck me as I, as I um, posted there that, you know, I've always wanted to try 08s, but I've never done it because I couldn't get a hold of them. But, you know, that can't be an issue now since, you know, I order my strings online anyway. So I might just try that next time, having 08 to 46. That would be kind of cool. Though I am worried I'd, I'd break a lot of strings, obviously. But uh, with 08s, I think that could work really well for vibrato. And uh, it, uh, as I said, sometimes actually th those thin gauges can help you cut through the mix because... Well, simply because they don't carry uh, as low <laughs> overtones, They're right? There aren't as many bass overtones. So it, the sound isn't as bassy, if you can even call it bassy when you're playing, you know, high up on the neck. <laughs> What's up, my man? Awesome to have you in here. Are you the Alfredo from back in the days? Or are you a new Alfredo? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. String height. It does. That's actually, I would say, my current, um, uh, is the word Achilles heel or something? That's a weakness of mine. The thing is, I've discovered how bad low action actually sounds. It sounds so crappy. Uh, so what I did, because when you have low action and, and you hit the strings hard, you get to hear all the rustling. So even if you're, you know, you're fretting, you might be fretting on the fifth fret, but... Uh, you know, on the sixth and seventh fret, the string will be vibrating and kind of touching the fret wire. Um, 
And the lower the action, the more of that you get. And it's not really a pleasant sound. So sound-wise, I much prefer having high action or, a, you know, lots of relief there, uh, like a bow, right? You want high action. But playing-wise, I want as low as possible. And uh, I actually went ahead and started just raising the action of all my guitars. And I was really happy because the sound was great. But then after a few weeks, it struck me that I can't play anything. I feel so bad. So I had to go back and just readjust the action and get lower action so I actually could start playing again. And then, yeah, it's, it's a sacrifice for sure. Um, maybe I, in the future, I'll be more strategic about it and maybe actually start practicing more on a high action guitar just to learn that. But for now, I'm, I'm too crappy to play like a high action guitar. I'd love to. Yeah, a high action is definitely better for the sound. I'd say that absolutely no objection for that. Because with a low action, you get the strings slapping against the fret wire, right? So uh, yeah, for sure. And if you have a guitar that you only use for like, uh, you know, sliding, then uh, you can have extremely high uh, action, right? With the, on this guitar, you're gonna hear some rattling. Uh. So if you hear that um, bright sound, it's, it's partly, I'd say, because of uh, the, the action being too low here. I don't typically do sliding on this guitar. I have a, a, a tele that has a bit of a, more of an action. I prefer to use that one. Oh yeah, pickups low on a strat. Uh, that, there's also a balance there. Basically a lot of pickups uh, will kill the sustain if, if you raise them a lot. So the magnets in the pickups are gonna make the strings vibrate less. Um, so that can be an issue. Um, and then also the further away from the strings, the less output you get. And some people want a lot of output, right? Uh, I just need enough output. I don't like high output pickups. I like low output pickups. So um, consistent with that, I also don't really mind lowering the pickups to get better sustain. And uh, also some people think they're in the way, which I guess can be the case as well. So I, I can't say I'm really, I'm really bothered by pickups that are in the way, but um, yeah. Um, so experiment with that and see whether you, you think it's worth the sacrifice of raising them. A lot of times I think it's, as you said, just have them low. deck on my strat i don't use tremolo a lot do you think that block with wood is a good solution oh i don't know the answer to that one i'm not sure what you mean by the deck either uh but uh, i think blocking a tremolo can be a great idea uh, a lot of times i wish i had you know the exact same guitar but without the tremolo because it would make things so much easier uh, but sometimes i use a tremolo so yeah it's, it's a tough one <laughs> but um Generally, I think if I were to buy a new guitar now, I would definitely avoid the tremolo. Just having a floating bridge on, on three guitars is more than enough maintenance-wise. I wouldn't want another one. Nico, how you doing, mate? 
I often need to lower the middle pickup because I often touch it with my pick when I plug play, play the strings harder. Do you experience this sometimes as well? Yeah, well, that's the, as I was saying earlier, that's the main objection I think a lot of people have, uh, that you can actually hit that one. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think if I raised it even more, I don't know if you can, can tell here. Yeah, you can see it's kind of low there. Um, but uh, if I if I raised it more, I'd probably hit it sometimes. Yeah, especially if you're. It depends on your style. Most of the times, I don't do a lot of you know whatever. But if you're really into that, I can imagine it can get painful. Most of the time, my movements are kind of small, small and controlled, and I'm I'm not hitting the pickup. It's not a big issue, even with the slapping. You know, I've done it on my other strap, which has higher uh, pickups. I don't, I don't know. I don't typically experience any problems with that. Cool. You like my my strat. Really happy to hear that. Um, yeah, this this is a cheap guitar. It's a vintage Icon V6. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. There you have it. Um, I like it a lot. Um, the thing is, it's interesting because it came with like vintage style pickups, low output, but they didn't sound very good. Yet it felt incredible to me because I think that's the first low output pickups I tried. Uh, and I was like, wow, there's something special with these. And I was like, oh, I have to get some high quality, low output pickups. So I uh, ordered these from Bare Knuckle. Uh, they're called Apache and they're their lowest output pickups in the single coil range. So I really like these pickups. Uh, you know, I can even play high gain with them in spite of them being super low output and dynamic. Uh, but it has to be said that these pickups cost as much as the whole guitar. So uh, you won't get this sound if you just, you know, get the, you can, I think you can buy these ones now from Toman. It's like, you know, 250 euros or something. It's a super cheap guitar, but you won't get this sound because I put a more expensive pickups in them. And I've done a little bit of fret leveling to get the action down. So I've done two major changes actually that I would say brings up the value of this guitar, though I doubt I could sell it for anything. <laughs> But for me, it brings up the value. I actually bought this one because I wanted to get a bit into luthering and um, get a bit better at tweaking the guitars myself. And I told myself, you know, I, keep, I have to get a cheap instrument because I might ruin it. But fortunately enough, I didn't ruin it. It turned out to be one of my favorite guitars now, even though it's, it's, it wasn't very expensive from start. And I also, uh, I used to take my guitar to the Plec machine which is an automated process to, to optimize string height and all that. It's a German machine and uh, um, it, it's a little expensive. You know, you, you, you get, get good results for like, uh, I, I'd say the equivalent of 200 bucks here in Sweden. Uh, but then I got myself the tool which I showed you earlier, which is the, the Katana tool, the, the Katana Rectify Master. Let us see if I can show you this. Looks like a looks like a flute, I'd say. <laughs> it's not a flute. Let's see if I can shoot. There we have it. So 
So what I can do with this tool, I can, by adjusting this thing here, I can adjust the bow or the relief so that it completely matches the one of my, um, the guitar neck, right? And that way, and also thanks to the construction here, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm able to squeeze this tool in under the strings and I can actually do a bit of fret leveling while the strings are on. Uh, and this is a really cool. Uh, it really simplifies the process. Uh, it makes it, it can, very easy to check whether you're good. You don't want to remove too much of the fret wires, right? So just, just enough. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what I've applied on this guitar and it gave me good results. Cool, George from Greece, how are you doing? I'm actually half Greek, but then Catalavena, Veno. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately I don't speak any Greek, which is kind of sad, but yeah, that's just how it is. Um, yes, the rosewood fretboard is very dark, very beautiful. I agree with you, mate. Uh, so there's a question by Sanka. Would Court X250 be a good choice? Not sure which genre I want to play mostly. Want to go with the versatile pickup set. I don't know what the guitar is. Give me the link and I'll check it out. You can give it to me now and we can check it out together. Uh, Court, I guess they, they've done cool guitars. Uh, I'm not even sure. I, I have no clue what the model is, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard. Yeah. If you want versatility, I guess single coils are good, but you're sacrificing the, the most uh, metal type of sounds. Uh, and the opposite is also true. You know, you, you can get humbuckers, uh, but then you, you're gonna lose some of the clean tones, so. Yeah, I guess you could call it a custom guitar. I mean, it's, it's factory made. There's nothing really custom with it, but it, it at least, uh, from a distance, it, it looks like it's relic, but it's not really relic, or the relic is extremely cheap here, but it, it's all good. Julio Mart, hello, what's up, my man? Oh, you love Greek yogurt, that's good. <laughs> So your name is Christos and you play the guitar. <laughs> Christos. It's a good one. Almost. Almost. If we have any French people here, I can actually speak French and Swedish, but unfortunately not Greek. about humbuckers that are in the size of single coil. Yeah, they're often called like um, noise-free single coils. Uh, they're okay, they have their place. I, I'd say they are mostly useful when you have a Strat with single coils and you're looking to put a humbucker in. That's when they're really useful because it's easy to just get one of those and put them in here. Uh, I don't really ever, um, I have never really liked the sound of noiseless single coils ever. They're okay for high gain, but they're not single coils. It's, like, it's a humbucker, so yeah. Um, but uh, you know, so, some, some guitars successfully combine, like you have, might have two noiseless here and a true single coil in the middle, and then you might find some in-between sounds that work, that, that's, that's okay. But to me, the, the really sweet tones, they come from real single chords, for sure. Ah, oh, Greek. <laughs> no, I can't. That would be like some kind of... <laughs> you hear what is it called? Bouzou? No, I don't know, but, but you know, traditional instruments, there's a lot of tremolo picking going on, but... Uh... No. Oh. 
I don't know. No, I can't. The answer is no. But, you know, I remember hearing that, that kind of sound, a lot of tremolo picking. <laughs> but I can't. And to be honest with you, I can't play anything traditional Swedish either. So uh, I guess the problem is that I'm really bad at traditional stuff. And there isn't that. I think there's actually more characteristic traditional Greek music than there is Swedish, I would guess. But it, probably same, same. Macaulay from Barcelona. That's a city I love visiting, but it's been a while. So maybe someday I'll come back to your great city of Barcelona. Buzuki. Mizi, Mizi, Lou. Is that a song? Is that the song? Yeah. I So I switched to like a softer pick, like a Fender style uh, pick that you, which you can actually bend just to get some of. Well, it is shredding. It is a way of shredding. Awesome to have you here. I, to be honest with you, it probably didn't sound like Greek music at all. But we do have, sorry, I have to plug GMC here. We have the Around the World series by Sinisa. Sinisa is, is the instructor who did the 40 Techniques video on this channel. Uh, and he has covered a really nice traditional Greek, uh, Greek uh, sounds there. Mizilu, yeah, no, I don't. Sounds, sounds uh, like I should know it. By the way, you're asking that question. I might have heard it. Uh, oh, I almost remember the name of some Greek artist that my parents used to play, but then I forgot it. Theodor... Ah, no. Sorry, it's been too long. Oh, that's interesting. Three guitars to buy. Uh, Stratelan Les Paul. I'm not sure about that. Oh, that's an insanely difficult question. I'd, I'd buy a Strat for sure. A Tele, maybe. Uh, Les Paul, I think I would, but that's individual. You could, uh, you could go for like some, some, um, some maybe some Ibanez instead. <laughs> it's a really tough one. But yeah, I'd probably go with at least like a fixed bridge humbucker guitar if I had to buy three guitars. So that could be a Les Paul. Could also be something else, like an, an, an RG with a fixed bridge. Uh, Telecaster, you could skip that. It's, it's a very special instrument. I have one, I like it, but uh, some think that the Telecaster is the most versatile guitar out there. But since you're going to be buying three, maybe that's not an issue. <laughs> maybe you want to get something with like, like a nylon string or something, or like, a, like an acoustic guitar, I don't know. Um, or maybe you want something even more metalish, more shred. Um, or maybe you want two strats. Two strats can sound totally different. Two strats and one less bolt. Ah, it's, it's a tricky one. I don't have any. Oh, Nikos Theodorakis. There he is. Sorry about that one. <laughs> uh, PRS. Mm, no. I don't have one. I'd love to have one at some point. Uh, that's, I guess, also supposed to be some kind of compromise between Strat and Les Paul. Um, I would love to uh, to try one at some point. up on the telly yeah uh, I think also a lot of people like the the, the bridge pick uh, the bridge pickup on the telly because um, it has a very special amount of you know twang since it's so close to the unique tele style bridge 
Some argue that actually, even if you have like a low output Telecaster, it's still cool for shredding on that pickup and metal on that pickup. Hence, you know, the versatility, the aspect there. And also because uh, Telecaster pickups are really uh, attached to the body in a way that Strat pickups are not. I mean, Strat pickups, they're just attached to this big piece of plastic and that's it. Whereas Telecasters, uh, they actually have screws that go down into the wood. So um, that really paves the way for cool sustain, right? Uh, so that's a the difference there. And also, uh, I guess a typical Telecaster pickups are a bit hotter usually. So yeah, <laughs> we got BRS reviews. To be honest with you, I don't have a huge amount of, of uh, experience from a Telecaster. I just have one and I like using it. Uh, I, I especially use it when I attempted some country. I tried to play, you know, the GMC instructor, Chris Schoffner. He's our country guy. Uh, and uh, he released one lesson that was really like, you know, country shred. Uh, I think it was called the hot country guitar, something like that. Hot. And I had to learn that one in spite of having zero, you know, no experience from uh, country. So I might just show you that just for the fun of it. Let's check it out there. So do hot country. Okay, so here's my lesson or my, my playing and we'll check out the original first and see what you think about it. So I've never played country before and I attempted to play this. Okay, I think that's enough. And then we can check out mine. There you can see my telly. Here's me trying to play this. But that's me trying to play country. Uh, and as you can tell, it's a struggle. I don't know why, but that, oh yeah, that's, we spoke about my telly. So that's why I wanted to show you this. Um, on any E string. But isn't that the, the, Oh, you're speaking about that Pulp Fiction thing, like, yeah. That thing. <laughs> and what is it then? Is that the Pulp Fiction thing? Is that it? I didn't know it was called Miserlou. Um... Turnarounds? Ah, oh, no, I can't. And the reason being, uh, I've never had to, and I just never liked the fact that you know I love jamming over the blues, but I never liked the fact that we, the twelve bar blues has existed for like forty years and no one changes it. So I just couldn't bother. Sure, under gun point, maybe I'd come up with something, but. <laughs> Uh, but I know I've never done that. Cool, so you guys like my country playing. Thanks a lot. That means the world. I have to be honest though that it's not fair to say I'm a complete beginner because I've been doing this uh, kind of hybrid picking for a long time. And that's what I speak about in the lesson. 
because uh, the reason I did a lesson covering his lesson, because I showed my journey to try to play that as a country beginner. Uh, so uh, I, I recorded a video every week sort of to, to show my progress there. But the thing is, I benefited hugely from having done a lot of hybrid picking, right? I, I've, you know, this kind of, um, you know, where I use that, that thing. I've done that a lot. And that's very useful because, uh, you know, the, the famous chicken picking technique is based around hybrid picking, but it involves more like percussive strings and dampened strings. So if you know high hybrid picking, learning chicken picking isn't going to be as difficult. Just wanted to say that so you don't think that I'm, I'm um, I don't know. <laughs> cool. So you like Albert Lee? Yeah, he's, he's, he's a classic there, especially his country boy too. Cool, George. I'm happy we could sort that one out. So I had heard it. Uh, but uh, Blues Turnaround, no, I'm too crappy. I like, I like the idea of just jamming around with... But I could just, I just, if I had ever played in a blues band, I probably would have had to learn the 12 bar, but I don't know. I could count, but I, <laughs> it's just too repetitive. But you know, if you want that sound, a lot of times just going down like a chromatic two, that, that B7 chord, you've heard that a million times. So uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, which is my favorite guitar style? Uh, I've always been extremely bad at, you know, learning like the framework for any style. Uh, I do know that if I want to play jazz, I should study two five ones and being good at those. Uh, for metal, I should probably learn something else. But I, you know, I've never liked the the, the framing of that. Um, I've always loved to, you know, borrow stuff from here and there. There simply because I'm not interested in becoming you know, like a clone. I want to um, I want to develop something on my own. So in a way, I think it's a conscious method. Uh, you know, when anything was very well defined, I sort of strayed from that. Um, I still, you know, wanted to learn as much as I could, but I wasn't interested in staying for too long within a, like a specific framework. So I could probably write down a 12 bar blues on paper. I, I know what it is, but I just bores me to death to sit and play 12 bar blues, the rhythm. But if I find a banging track, someone else who does it really well, I love playing over it. So, you know, it's, it's a bit weird, I guess, in a way. But for me, the number one priority has always been uh, to... Uh, yeah, develop some kind of voice on my own, uh, of my own. So I've just, what I've done is I've always just stolen stuff from different genres. So I guess you could say maybe I do fusion because I do a mix of stuff. <laughs> uh, now, I, I really like a lot of the typical blues soloing techniques, you know, you know, a lot of bending and, and stuff like that comes from the blues. A lot of specific blues licks that I love playing, uh, but I wouldn't say I know a lot of blues. I'm, I'm, I'm probably crappy at that. So yeah, maybe weird reply, but you know, I think it's important to find whatever inspires you, right? Because um, if you just try to play something that supposedly is correct, you're gonna get bored to death. You know, you really have to hone in on what you love doing. And I never really enjoyed fitting into a framework. I always wanted to do my thing. Uh, and that can be a bit of an annoyance sometimes, but it's the only thing that works. It's the only method that works for me. So I had to go that way. And therefore, I cannot say that I'm comfortable in any genre. I, I think I could get away jamming and improvising in most genres, except for like maybe jazz stuff that has a lot of changes. But I, I don't know any, I'm not comfortable in any genre. I can't say. I got a PV Raptor Plus. Plus, looks similar to that icon. I know you modded that one. PV Plus has a port. Ah, which one are you thinking about? Like an old, I had an old PV XXX. Is that the one you're thinking about? But your memory is really strong if you remember that one. 
to that. Oh no, the vintage icon. Okay, so PV Raptor Plus, is that a guitar? Oh, I get you now. Okay, so it looks similar to this guitar, the vintage V icon, uh, I get you. <laughs> um, it has a port on the side instead of, okay. Oh, so you don't have the, the, the input jack here on the front, you have it on the side, I get it. Cool, yeah, I've seen some cool kind of Strat style guitars by PV. I'd love to try one sometime. Do I like Dream Theater and Petrucci? I do. I like uh, like the first albums, especially the Images and Words and Awake albums, really cool albums, especially Awake. I listened to that one, you know, like any strong song metal album and disregarding the fact that there's some really cool uh, guitar work going on there. Uh, so it's primarily those two albums. And I got, I had his, uh, I still have it, I think, his REH video. Uh, and that was inspirational. It, it wasn't quite as inspirational as, you know, Paul Gilbert, but still, you know, just his routine and stuff like that. I, I found that really interesting, the way he was super structured about his practicing. And he had those occasional jams uh, in between the long exercises, and they were really good. So that was inspirational. Uh, <clears throat> do you know that learn song is good to get better guitars? Um, so yeah, learning songs, you know, that that's the way a lot of us um, need to start, right? Because that's the only thing that inspires us. Um, and it's, it's fairly doable. A lot of guitar, like strumming chord songs, you know, they can be easily playable, right? You know. <laughs> You know, whatever, uh, that's uh, fairly doable. Uh, we can get started with something. Uh, so that's actually the, the most common way and the, I did that as well. Uh, I didn't do it very well though, <laughs> but I tried and that's inspirational. You know, I had these, uh, that's kind of, you know, Nirvana stuff and even like, whatever. Well, there we have it. So um, yeah, um, I did that, uh, and it's it's a very good way to get started on the instruments. Um, now the reason I have a slightly different perspective is because I'd say you know the GMC website doesn't really cater for people just wanting to learn songs, uh, and that's because it's nothing. In, 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 when I started to get serious about the guitar, I had totally left you know, the song stage. I just wanted to you know, get a better at lead playing. I just wanted to start developing my own voice and uh, on the guitar. And I, uh, you know, later on, I wanted to just focus on my jamming and improvising. So naturally, that's kind of where the site is going as well. Um, so it's, we've never really been interested in, in the song thing. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, for most part, for most people, you need to learn a lot of songs before you're able to output like a song of your own. So if you're interested in writing material, uh, it can be very useful. Um, that's a maiden song. White man came across the sea. Think, maybe. song. <laughs> okay, Vi, Satriani, Gilbert or Petrucci? Um, I'd say Satriani and then Vi, then Petrucci, then Gilbert in terms of, you know, music, but in terms of being inspired by, I think Gilbert might be on top there. <laughs> I actually have his signature guitar as well. 
Uh, so um, it depends a little bit what perspective I'm, I'm taking there. So this has been a really nice session. We've been hanging out and just speaking about anything guitar related. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, the, the idea with this session, uh, and I've started doing these recently, is just for me to be available to you. Because it struck me that I do a lot of practicing on my own and there's no real reason why I can't just, you know, turn on that camera and, and be with you guys. And, you know, I do a little bit of practicing. We can do some talking. Maybe I can help you guys with your practicing. So uh, just uh, to say that there will be more of these sessions and uh, if you want to keep track of them, uh, you can follow me on, on here at YouTube, but also on the GMC forum on my personal board. I announce these streams and also on the GMC uh, Facebook page, of course. Uh, but uh, I really hope I'll be able to meet you again here. And it'd be interesting to know also if you're working on any of my previous live streams. We've covered a lot of different topics, uh, but I'd say they all somewhat relate to this idea of you know developing your own style and then working on your lead shops and maybe even your technique shops and that kind of stuff, which is uh, really what I'm focused on and what I love doing. Um, so yeah. Um, Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, I'll meet you soon again. Cheers, guys.